Welcome to Spartan Up Podcast. We're here at City Field, Spartan Stadium race. Perfect setting for this interview. We interview Eric Byrne. This guy had a major league career, uh, worked his tail off to get there, uh, but he's going to tell us not only what it takes to get there, but once you get there, what it's all about, what it means, what you do after it. This guy uh, has created a career beyond. Um, really inspiring, incredible guy. I just want to say a ton of energy. We were around high energy yeah. people. <laughs> Holy jumping. This is some high Finally. energy. Not any Speaking less, of high energy, who not are we? Any less than, uh, than me. There you go. Joe from Spartan, Sephra, the seed huntress, Johnny, the doctor, and Colonel Nye. Right here. We are your grit and resiliency partners every day now. You know, Tuesdays, we bring you interviews, incredible people like Eric. But other days, we have our experts who teach you tips and tricks how to be a better, stronger, more motivated person. Subscribe, engage, comment. You know what? Share this with your friends and family. We're trying to rip a mil- hundred million people off the couch. We got million millions already. And, and stay till the end because at the end we're going to recap everything we learned from this super high energy. Uh, super Zeus. high energy. We'll call Four unique Zeus. perspectives yeah. on this. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> this episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Gone Rogue High Protein Chips. Visit GoneRogueSnacks.com. Enter promo code Spartan twenty five for twenty five percent off. <laughs> Welcome to Spartan Up Podcast. We're here at City Field today, and it's actually a pretty cool place to be because I'm with somebody with a baseball background. How about this? I mean, we, we need a ball game out here, though, Johnny. Yeah, well, seriously, we have an incredible view. It's sick, sweet, yeah. and I'm looking out there just. Eh. So it's Eric Burns. Mm-hmm. Um, Correct. Uh, we're going to talk about all the other stuff you're doing now, but uh, you were a baseball player. Tell us about that. I was. I mean, I think just as a kid, I grew up playing a bunch of sports. My dad was actually a 4 3 black belt in Kempo Karate, uh, my mother was this avid tennis player. And somehow, some way, I fell in love with baseball. And I just, you know, when I was a kid, there was a... Um, and where no, is this? This is, I grew up in Northern California, about yeah. 20 miles south of uh, San Francisco. And uh, there was a kid across the street that was one of the best players in Little League. And so he needed somebody to pitch to. And so I was kind of like his dummy, where I'd stand in there and uh, he'd just fire balls at me. And pretty soon after... You know, a while I started catching up to him, and um, it was it's it's incredible how things have changed though. Because sure. back then, free play was almost something that everybody did, yeah. And now it's almost something that nobody does. So the minute they saw any talent it, nowadays, the minute they saw that little bit of talent, everything else would be gone. You just well, be- you play how you're playing travel ball. Yeah, like yeah. I didn't play organized baseball until I was eight years old, and that was t-ball, yeah. which. It's not really baseball. It's always a tie. <laughs> and then when I was nine was really my first year of, of playing. And it's it's incredible because my kid, he was three when he started playing baseball. Yeah. Three. And I think there's some good things in that. I also think that um, you're going to see some kids burn out. And, yeah. and I think there's an, still the element of free play that we need, that all kids need. Sure to really be able to love what they do. And a lot of how I learned to play baseball wasn't that I wasn't playing baseball at that age. It's just we were playing with a wiffle ball in the backyard imitating our favorite players. Sure. Um, And I was taking a a tennis ball and chucking it it off the roof and having it come down and making diving catches. And that was was everything. And now it's just just different. And I'm not, again, I want to be cautious in saying that it was way better back then, and yeah. you know we get caught up in that all the time. But yeah, it was cool. I mean, I just one of those crazy things where I was this kid from the small little town in Northern California that really there's nobody in my family ever played baseball, and um, I was just really fortunate to kind of just keep playing, and no so, one ever told me to stop. Mm-hmm. Um, where'd you play? So I uh, ended up um, going to UCLA, yeah, and I got drafted out of high school by yeah. Los Angeles Dodgers. And ended up going to school instead. And I went to uh, UCLA, played three years there, was drafted by the Houston Astros, went back to school again to finish at UCLA, and got drafted by the Oakland A's. So this is 1998. Yep. And I signed. I went to Southern Oregon. So this is how baseball works with the minor leagues, right? Yep. You start at the very bottom. I went to Southern Oregon, Southern Oregon to Visalia, Visalia to Modesto, Modesto to Midland. Uh, Midland, Texas to Sacramento. In the meantime, stints in the Dominican Republic, uh, in Mexico as well for winter ball. Um, and then August 22nd of 2000, so it was a lot, a two-year period, yeah. I got called to the big leagues. 
once I call it the big leagues, I went up and down nine different times. So you've made it, but there's <laughs> yeah, but still a process. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Hey, here we are. We're at the grand finale. We're at the big race. And, and then someone says, nah, you know what? Sit this one out. Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah, Johnny, it was, um, it was a trip, man. And, and it was really cool. Yeah. Um, I think the novelty wore off a little bit once I was doing the up and down thing for a while. <laughs> and then I finally got an opportunity to, uh, to play every day yep. and sort of ran with it. And, and where was that now? Uh, that was in Oakland. Okay, yeah. And it was a, a right fielder got hurt and um, ended up like, Burns, you know, go out to right field. And it was funny because there was another guy. It sounds, that was, it sounds like uh, the minor league ball again. Or not uh, like T-ball again. Hey, you, go to right field. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it really, it really yeah. doesn't change. Yeah. And uh, so I ended up, ended up running out there. There was another guy that was kind of ahead of me on the pecking order. And the funny thing is, is that, and the other guy you could make a very good argument was better than me, yeah. too. But there was something that the manager, um, he just wanted some energy. It was sure, like yeah. a day game where it was kind of a lull. And they're like, yeah, put, put Burns in. And you could tell, like, almost like with reluctance he said it. Yeah. And I went in, and I ended up uh, getting a hit. Mm -hmm. And then for the next 22 games, I got a hit every single day. So nice. I went on a 22-game hitting streak, which is, uh, like, rare. Yeah, pretty rare, yeah, very yeah. rare. And that was kind of how I held him hostage and, and, and stayed in the big leagues. But, yeah, it was just the experience of playing professional baseball in, in Major League Baseball. And, you know, I don't want to wax poetic about yeah. it or whatever, but it really is. It's like, you know, the scene out of Bull Durham. The yeah. ballparks are like cathedrals. You hit white balls for batting practice. The women all have long legs and brains. And <laughs> I, it was uh, just a really special experience. And I think one of the things um, about baseball, which is really cool, is that it's a very humbling sport. Mm -hmm. So instead of, say, you know, feeling like you're on top of the world and taking things for granted, I felt like I was able to go through that process and actually really enjoy it and yeah. enjoy it for what it's worth and and not get caught up in the hoopla that surrounds it where did where did that end where did that transition to something else well <laughs> i ended up um like every athlete has they have, we all have our sob story i ended up uh, in arizona and so i played for oakland for five years 2000 2005 and then uh got traded to colorado they loved me so much that two weeks later, they traded me to Baltimore. <laughs> okay. uh, Baltimore loved me so much that two months later, they released me. I was, jeez, ah, probably about 30 years old, uh, out of a job, trying to figure out what's next, and started kind of dabbling in TV and radio. Yeah. I went to work for ESPN after the season, and really my first job offer that offseason was with ESPN Radio. Yeah. And uh, I, I want to ask, because I know a lot of athletes, they have – the quarter life crisis, right? It's like this career's done. I don't know what I'm going to do next. They all do. So, so what what was it about you that created the opportunity to, to have um, another path in, in in broadcast? Well, this is interesting because look, I'm very much a believer, and you get out what you put in. So, you know, here I was now, and when I was a kid too, I loved sports talk radio. I just thought it was everything. I listened to this guy Pete Franklin, Ralph Barbieri, just some Bay Area local legends. And I love debating sports. I love talking about sports. And so I knew when I was a kid even, I'm like, man, there's two things I want to do in life. Number one, I want to play professional sports. And that wasn't necessarily even baseball. I just loved all sports. And number two, I want to talk about sports. So I want to be on the radio or I want to be on TV and I want to be on these debate shows or whatever it is. And uh, it was funny because I turned this paper in and this was in the seventh or eighth grade. And my English teacher he gave it back to me and she's like, Every kid wants to play professional sports, and every kid wants to talk on the radio. It's like you got to, you got to change it. You got to pick something be else. more realistic. Well, I took him home to my mom. I told her, I said, "Mom, like, you know, Mrs. Such and Such wants me to change this," and she, she, she's it. She's like, "You tell her to call me. <laughs> You're gonna be a president." So she, yeah. that was that was always cool to have that yeah, parent sure, support. Sure. The great thing was is that in my mind, at least career wise, I knew what I wanted to do next in the, in the broadcasting world. And immediately, I got a job with ESPN, and I went and started broadcasting these college baseball games. But the one thing that was missing was the physical grind, right? What I would, had been used to and the training and everything else. And so I ran into three junior high school friends of mine uh, at the beach in Half Moon Bay, just totally randomly. And they were saying that they were going down to do a triathlon in Pacific Grove, which is down near Pebble Beach, uh, in like two weeks. They're like, hey, why don't you come down and do it? I'm like, 
yeah, sure, why not? And I've always had this fascination when I was a kid. My dad and I used to always watch the Iron Man triathlon on, on TV when it come on ABC. And I have this lasting image of Julie Moss crawling to yeah, the I finish well. line. Yeah, yeah. And so it was something that always fascinated me. I'm like, yeah, this is perfect. I'll go do a triathlon. And now, well, and it's good because you, you, you walk in today and you still look more like a player than a broadcaster. <laughs> I mean, Thank in you. a good way, right? I mean, there's something you said for, I used to be a player, now I've got a punch and I talk about it instead. So, so you're still keeping a foot in both worlds. Well, yeah, and so that led to basically going out there and almost drowning in the water. Okay. You understand? Like, I was comfortable in the water because I surfed. Yeah. But at the same time, they have this kelp in there, and they call it the kelp crawl. And so it's literally, like, sucking you down. And 1,500 people kicking water in your face at the same time. and Miserable. Yeah, yeah. Like, I literally, this isn't a joke, I thought I was going to die. Yeah. And I almost, like, came to grips with it, and... I was out there. I was like, okay, this is the time is the time is now. <laughs> and when I ended up like, this looks like a good place to go. I watched, I watched up on the beach, uh, on the beach, like just like, I mean, whatever you would imagine. Just like, Bleh. and I'm lying there, and I'm just watching all these people pass me, and I'm just re- remember thinking like, I'm, I'm so they're, they're all running thankful. For the bikes. I'm alive. Yeah, they're going for the bike. So then I go for my bike, right? And I got a beach cruiser. I had no idea. I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> Beach cruiser, hop on the beach cruiser, I start cruising this thing. I'm like, oh, just so happy to be on the bike. I'm like the sympathy, hey, get, go beach cruiser, dude. Like this, that. I showed up with the beach cruiser. This is a funny thing. I showed up on the beach cruiser, like not as a joke. I showed up on the beach cruiser. It's like this is the only bike I have. So now I'm going on the beach cruiser, and I'm getting passed by 16-year-old girls. And I know this because we had to put our, our age on the side of, of the, or on the, on the back of the calf. Yeah. And... So I end up running a couple miles, finish the race, go to my friends. I'm like, yeah, it's, that's the greatest experience I ever had in my life. Then every one of them kicked my ass. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I told them, I said, it's the last time you, any of you guys will ever beat me. Yeah. And so I went and bought a triathlon bike the next day, uh, found a swim coach, Frank Soul out in Arizona, who, you know, very thankful. But Frank's like, what do you want to do with this? So I said, you know what, one day I want to do an Ironman. I'm thinking years down the road. He goes, Iron Man Arizona has, still has charity spots left. He goes, go sign up. I'll have you ready in 11 months. And I couldn't comprehend that. Yeah. But you know what? I said, fuck it. I'm in. Yeah. And 11 months later, um, became, became a first-time Iron Man. And over the course of the next, geez, what, like seven years? I mean, I've completed 11 now. So, so this strikes me as a perfect segue. We're going to take a break. Yeah, uh, we'll uh, we'll go try and find an Iron Man to do nearby. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's anything on today. We'll see. And uh, and when we come back, I want to talk about um, uh, where this philosophy is taking you now. Cool. Don't worry, Spartans. We'll be right back to our episode in a second. But we want to take a quick uh, sponsorship time out here and talk about our sponsor, Gone Rogue High Protein Chips. This is kind of a, as Rogue would imply, kind of a a new source for protein here. This is a cross or a merger if you will between a jerky and a potato chip I mean, high in protein looks like a chip tastes great it's a hybrid right the parental it material is. f1 i think what it's chicken and jerky or chips Ch- would be chicks <laughs> oh nice okay all <laughs> yeah. right all right okay. so if you think about like i mean this is something i've never seen before but if you think about how you know indigenous cultures are over whenever you would hunt and gather you would have to find a way to smoke or dry or preserve your meat so you could have it for the whole season or make pemmican to bring with you on the trail so this is kind of just a modern day way to preserve that meat and bring it with you when speaking of bringing meat with you i've been at a lot of long distance races where you see people will have their their different forms of of protein that they want to bring on the trail with them and uh, you see a lot of jerky out there and things like that. It all adds weight, and it sounds crazy, but when you're running at altitude, you want almost no weight. So this, what is it, 17 grams Super of protein. Super light, I mean, too. Yeah, seven, 17 grams of protein in two ounces. One. I didn't believe that's what it was in one, one ounce, one. Yeah. and only two carbs. So, um, you know, I don't see this as a sitting on the couch kind of snack. I see this as an active bring your food with you kind of snack. So if you want to go rogue. You should go to goneroguesnacks.com. Goneroguesnacks.com. Use Spartan25. That's the code that will get you 25% off, and you can take this to your next race. So I'd like to pretend that uh, not being a triathlete, I could now just challenge you to, uh, say, an ultra marathon instead. But I have a feeling that wouldn't work out very well for me either because <laughs> you have some experience there. So tell me about Western States. Well, if, first of all, like, it's funny because when we talk about the endurance world and the whole thing, even with Spartan, like, I think it's one big family. Sure. I really do. Very and sure. I think there's a ton of crossover yep. with all of them. Yeah. Um, as far as Western States, it was so... If you think about triathlon, like triathlon is it's swimming, 
it's biking and it's running yeah. and we could play around with it and say yeah there's a science to the technique of doing a triathlon when it comes to what sort of power wattage that you're going to put out and still be able to run and yeah 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 whatever but the bottom line is it's it's endurance right sure, and it's yeah. and it and it's just us getting out there getting our heart rate going and and getting the blood flowing and so i just western states is interesting because I'd heard about Western States, and this goes back to 2006. And there was a um, there was something in the newspaper, and it might have been USA Today or something or whatever. And I remember sitting in the Diamondbacks clubhouse reading an article about this dude that had finished Western States, right, run a hundred miles. And then they disqualified him because he collapsed on the track. And then when he collapsed on the track, people helped him get up. Yeah. They didn't help him run. That's right, yeah. They helped him get up. Yeah. And then he gets disqualified. And it's the same sort of thing with the triathlon and Julie Moss. And it's just when you see this, you think to yourself like, wait, what? This guy ran 100 miles. Yeah. And it was almost like. No, not almost like I, I had no comprehension of it. The same way I couldn't really comprehend an Ironman when I first started hearing those distances. Again, when I first started swimming, I couldn't swim 25 yards in a pool without stopping. Right. I, so I, I remember the first time I heard about somebody running 50 miles and I thought it was a typo. Cause it's like, well, no, cause a marathon's 26. You can't run 50. No, no. Like with the marathon was, it's the pinnacle. It, it, it's it, but it just goes to show you we're constantly putting limits on ourselves. And, our society then buys into these limits, and then we think, okay, this is it. This is all we can do, and this is what I love about the ultra world. The ultra world says, nah, we don't have any limits, yeah. and, and if we do, we're going to find them. Yeah. We're, they're not going to be predetermined by somebody else, and so it was very much a process as far as getting to Western states. Your baseball player, which is a, a sp- specific sport and then you go into um you know some cross training for the the uh, ironman so now you're you're able to swim you're able to run you're able to bike but this is a whole different animal i mean western states for anyone who doesn't know it's not just 100 miles it's 100 incredibly grueling miles at elevation on really tough terrain with a very high dropout rate you know first you got to qualify for it and then and then you've got to um finish it which most people don't mm-hmm. so so how how does a baseball player from northern california end up well, this is North California too, but how, how does he end up running this race? Well, I, like anything, and how do you succeed? Like anything else, like you, you just, I immersed myself in the culture, and ideally, if I do a crazy one of your good ultra Spartan races one day, I'm going to do the exact well, same no, no, thing. Not if, when? Yeah, exactly. When? <laughs> um, yeah, the death race is is, is, is fascinating. Yeah. I, I I'm in. We can talk a lot more about that later, and on. we yeah, and yeah. we will. Um, but. You get out what you put in in life. Sure. And that's the one thing I really learned in baseball. And I'm going to backtrack for a second here. And so it's like, okay, how do you, like every kid, a lot of kids, that it's, at least that played Little League Baseball, want to become a Major League Baseball player. And so, you know, I'll get asked all the time, like, you know, when was it? What was it about, you know, say you, for example, that was, you know, why were you able to make it? And the funny thing is, is that there's, so my dad used to throw me back in practice. Yeah. And he didn't even play baseball. Again, I've told you that. But he chucked enough ninja stars in his day to sure, yeah. know how to do it. Yeah. And so we went from, right, but we talked about my neighbor who used to throw me VP. And then now, you know, my dad would throw me a ton of batting practice. And I was playing Little League. And then for my 13th birthday, um, my parents got me a present. And they thought they were so funny. They're like, yeah, his name's Mike. I'm like, I'm like, what are you talking about? And so in the backyard, they'd built me a batting cage. Nice. And inside the batting cage was this pitching machine called Iron Mike. And it goes to... Dung, right and so this iron mic pitching machine you crank it up to 90 miles per hour yep. and from day one at 13 years old i put up a 90 miles per hour so here i was now going to st francis high school which i thought i got cut from the freshman baseball team as a matter of fact my name was even on the list and it said chris burns at the bottom and i thought for sure i was cut and i went running after the coach and i'm like I'm like, hey, hey, Coach Ferreira, Coach Ferreira. And he turns around and he goes, what can I do for you, Chris? I'm like, oh, nothing, man. We're good. I'll see you practice, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. here I am at St. Francis now, and I'm a sophomore, yeah. and I get called up to the varsity, and we're facing Sarah High School. 
to, I mean, just every, I can't tell you all how many great athletes have gone. Barry Bonds, Tom Brady, like just, this was a pinnacle of, of school. But I get there, and there's a guy on the mound by the name of Dan Serafini. Greg Jeffries was another one. I'd have to mention him because we're here at uh, City Field, one of the great all-time Mets. But uh, Dan Serafini was on the mound. He was a left-hand pitcher through 94 miles per hour. And everyone was getting in the box. It's just like they'd never seen it before. 94 miles per hour from the left side in high school. It's just, you know, one strikeout after. No one could touch him. I get up there, just got called up to the varsity. I didn't make the varsity when I was, you know, at the beginning of the season, right? Get called up to the varsity. First pitch against Dan Serafini. Whack! Bullet up the middle. Next pitch against Dan Serafini. Next time I get up there. Whack! Another bullet up the middle. Next pitch. Whack! Another bullet up the middle. I didn't even have hair on my balls yet, and I just hit three bullets against Dan Serafini, who throws 94 miles per hour, who's going to be a first-round draft pick with 50 to 100 scouts in the stands. Yeah. That's how I got noticed. Yeah. But do you think that was by accident? I had been seeing 90-plus miles per hour for the past three years. I would hit before school. I would hit after school. I'd hit before I, football practice. I'd come home at football practice. I wanted to rig lights to, in the cage. I went to rig lights just so I could, just so I could hit. Yeah. I became obsessed with hitting. Right? And, 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 and so it wasn't an accident. That's why I learned how to hit 90 plus mile per hour. And when you say it's not an accident, we've talked to so many different people from so many different backgrounds. But one thing that's really common is that it isn't just that you have to have natural talent, which you do. It isn't just that you have to have passion, which you do. It isn't just you have to put the work in. It's got to be all three, right? Like you, you're, you're a guy who, if you didn't have any talent, it doesn't matter how many times you do it. But there's some people with the talent who don't put that work in who don't go and face those 90-mile-an-hour pitches because they'd rather have the machine throw them 70-mile-an-hour ones that they can knock out of the park every day. Johnny, I can't tell you how many guys, when I got into professional baseball, that had way more talent than I ever had. Mm -hmm. Never made it. Yeah. And it's interesting because even within professional baseball, once you sign, and there's minor leaguers, right, there is 10%, maybe, that make it. And that's 10% of guys that are already playing professional baseball sure. that make it to the big leagues. So it's, it's a combination of a lot of things. And there's, of course, some luck involved, but it, you're creating your luck. 100%. Con- constantly. Yeah. It's you're, the work you put in and the, uh, the attitude you approached it with and you showed up. It's the, it's the, en- it's the attitude yeah. and the effort yeah. that you carry with you on a daily basis. You want to walk around and feeling like the world's against you? Guess what? <laughs> the world's going to be against you. And so there's a lot of guys I know that were diligent workers, that were incredibly talented, and they just had this piss poor, you know, sort of attitude of negativity that followed them everywhere, and they never made it. So I want to ask you, speaking of attitude, you said something earlier when you said, uh, you know, I'm going to do this triathlon. And uh, it sounds like there's a philosophy that came out of that. You, uh, you've got a book. Obviously, playing professional baseball and then getting out of professional baseball and the transition to triathlon and the broadcasting that led me to Western States. And so there was this time period, say, for between like 2011 and 2016. And it was a very um, reflective sort of time for me. In 2011, my dad passed away unexpectedly. And, I, you know, I, I think at that point, I kind of stepped back and just kind of looked at life. And I just finished playing professional baseball. And so I'm going through this major transitional period. And I'm, I'm trying to get in these triathlon. And, um, and so one of the things I really love to do uh, scholastically was write. And it was one of the things I hadn't done in a long time so I just kind of started journaling a lot of the stuff and a lot of the cool things that had happened and good bad and ugly um I went through some experiences when I was a kid that were super heavy my best friend was killed when I was 11 on a bike ride that you know in my mind I probably should have been with him um my first love my just everything like the girl you think you're gonna marry was killed in a car accident when I was 18 so I think when you deal with these things, um, when you're younger, you deal with them and you don't necessarily know how or why you deal with them, and then life goes on. And I think one of the things that I found is I sort of reflected on, on all of this 
was that, man, like there were some really cool things that came out of it. And as much as all of this stuff was, was really difficult, it also was very, um, it was very educational. And, and so when I finished Western States, I'm about mile 97, and I'm going across No Hands Bridge. And a buddy of mine explained to me, he said, I said, well, what's it going to be like, right? He'd done Western States four times. And he said, Western States, he said, is like living a lifetime in a day. And I didn't really understand what that meant. But I got to mile 97, and I thought about my day. And I said, man, I just lived a f***ing lifetime in a day. And I decided at that point, I had all these writings. I said, I'm going to figure out something to do with them and I'm going to put them together and I want to share this experience yep. which was the Western States experience but I also want to share the experience that I dealt with and the things that made, say, made me who I was and, and drove me And but I knew that I like telling stories and I think I'm a decent storyteller but I didn't just want to tell stories I wanted to give something of value to somebody who was going to take the time to read it and so I ended up putting this thing together and um, long story longer on how this whole thing came up there was this it, going back to college we had a productivity chart and the productivity chart was something that we'd all write down like what we do like wake up cold shower yaksa weight training art history class whatever it almost was kind of a joke yeah. but it was like who could get the most done in a day well that list it was called the fuck it list. Okay. And so when it came to trying to name the book, I just felt like I had to pay homage to that list sure. because that list helped me structure my life. That list put me, as much as it was a joke, it just kept me charging forward and it kept me just, just on track, just da, 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 in everything that I did in my life. And so when I played baseball, my nickname was the human crash test dummy. <laughs> and I've run into a lot of walls and whatnot, so... Um, as I sort of deciphered all the stories that I had accumulated through the course of my life, I, I said, you know what, let's pull these lessons out of there. Yeah. What are these lessons? And it was a challenge for myself. And so the book is called the effort list. So life lessons from a human crash test dummy. Fantastic. So because our viewers, um, hopefully some of them are going to buy the book and actually read all these lessons and, and learn from them. Others are, um, you know, they're going to watch this and they're going to be inspired. They're going to want to do something and put in action right away. If you were to give them the best of the best, you know, if you were to say, here are three things that if you don't do anything else, do these three things, and you're going to have a greater level of success, greater level of happiness and appreciation in your life. What would they be if, if you were to pick three? Um, I, it's, this is, <laughs> get out what you put in. N number one, number one is that. And, uh. It's the start that stops us. I constantly on that. I like that. Co const constantly, it's it's like as soon as we get going, mm -hmm. we're fine. But like for example, going to do the triathlon, and we all have every excuse in the book. It's like it's it's the can't versus the won't, right? Sure. It's me saying I can't do this. I can't go do a triathlon with you guys, which I said. Yeah. I I don't know if I'm gonna be able to live through the swim experience. I don't own a, a triathlon bike and I'd never run more than four miles in my life. Right. And then all of a sudden I'm like, nah, it's not that I can't do these things because I very easily can. It's that I won't do these things. And then that kind of goes back to it's the start that stops us where all we have to do is get going and then run with it. But we don't do it because we make these excuses because of these societal limitations. And it's, it's a shame. It, it, it really is, and it's sad. And so when I watch my friends now, right? I'm 43 years old, and I see my friends, and I'm like, I call them 50-50s. I got like 50% of the guys are, are doing great and they're successful and, and, and they're moving and they're in shape and, and they're charging life like they should be. And the other 50% are starting to mail it in? Not starting to mail it in. They mailed it in. They mailed it in a long time ago. 
and they're miserable. They're not happy in their job. They're not happy in their marriage if they're in one, whatever relationship they're in. And typically, they're, they're, they're out of shape. And it's movement. What movement does for all of us, we were designed to move. Yeah. Human beings were designed to move. Movement gives us life. It's, it's, it's simple blood flow. That says this is what we're doing. I mean, we sit here long enough. You move; it stimulates the brain, and so that's. So, I don't know. I mean, that's that's really one of the so, so key I, things I would focus. I, on. I take it sitting across from you. You know, you've played major league baseball. And that that's a pretty high high. You've you've finished uh, Western States a pretty high high. You've uh, done eleven Ironmans pretty high high. You've had a movie made about. You've written a book. I'm guessing in talking to you that you would still say your 43 best years are ahead of you. Is that fair to say? Compared to most people who talk about the glory days, like you, you're, you sound like a guy who's got a lot of good years ahead of you still. Johnny, yeah. Well, here's the thing. It, it's it's funny because the, the glory years and this and that. Like, I, I heard someone someone said, like, I heard some overheard someone say, "Oh, the, they were in high school." So, like, the four best years of your life. I'm like, dude, high school, four best years of your life. No, no. Like, what we have now. Is it? I used to always say, like, what's next, right? What's next? Where, where, where are we going? That, again, that was a lot of the effortless and, and, and would kind of keep me on track with, uh, with everything, with all of us. Um, and I, a couple years ago, I really started thinking about it. I'm like, you know what? It's not really about what's next. It's about what's now. And we could have a plan for what's next, and we like to talk about what's next, but part of that, that like, that's happening in the now, yeah. right? If, I, if I'm looking at that you know, Spartan emblem over there, that dude's staring at me, right, with the mask right here, and he's like, dude, the death race burns, come and get some, right? That's in the future, and I'll look at what's next, but we're preparing this right now, yeah. right? This is... Like to, to to fully immerse yourself in the in the moment of where you are, having this conversation, and I mean this squad of the whole podcast team here, my little dude right here. Hopefully, you're taking notes, <laughs> young go hard. <laughs> so that like so that. so that sounds like that's number three. Is 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 all that matters is what you do right now. That's what's going to determine what comes later on. Is what you're doing right now, right now, yeah, right now. And we we live in a culture where. We're so distracted by everything. Attention spans at an all-time low. And obviously, I was a kid. I grew up full blown ADHD. But it's, it's, really, it's really, I think, now more than ever, FaceTime, real FaceTime, personal experience, like just even like touch coming back and forth because we live in this bullshit world of devices that's not real. And you live in this false world, young go hard. Understand <laughs> this. It's your future that is, is going to dictate where society goes. And we need your people, your crew, your iGen to wake up and understand there's more to life than devices. Yeah. The, 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 the great thing is... Uh... The great thing is the, the young fellow that he's talking with here is uh, is Marion's son who's doing some sound for us today, who lives in Vermont. And th th this this kid does get out and, and do it. He's a he's he's pretty fantastic. You're talking you're preaching to the choir it. right there. It. I love it. Hey brother, thank you so much for bringing this energy here. It's it's awesome. Um, first and foremost, it is energy. You bring experience and you bring ideas. You bring philosophies. But man, the energy that you bring is is incredible. Like that's and I think that's what's allowed you to to capitalize on those philosophies and, and everything else. Yeah, I just I think at this point I I just really like sharing it. And you know, I think life look, there's my dad used to always tell me this, he said, There's two things in life I can give you that nobody will ever be able to take away. Education and experience. And it's like, yeah, man. And now the other thing he would say, um, which if you ask me, you know, if we're gonna list like say life mantras that I would put towards the top of the list is don't take your feelings too personal. Yep. And that's a tough one because it's like our feelings are what we are. And even for me, I was a very emotional baseball player. When I'm out on the race course racing or doing whatever, like I feel like I pour my heart and soul into everything that I do. I have a lot invested. I care. But the funny thing is, is that all of us 
take our feelings too personal. And we let the petty things in life say, steal our energy, you know, attention. And we're like, oh man. And the reality of the situation is that if we're able to step back and look at it, like the world's not out to get us. This person's not, it's just, we're so many things that, that we let bother us. I've gotten really into Stoic philosophy. Amor fati and momentum mori. Amor fati is love your fate, right? And then momentum mori, we all will die. And it's not the Stoics didn't, you know, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, Seneca. They, they didn't talk about moment, momentum mori to scare people. But basically, you bring it up to understand that your impermanence is real. And once you understand that, you're going to live. Yep. And you're going to do everything in your power to live your life. Because at some point, this is going to end for us. And so why not get as most out of life as we can? So to be able to, say, float some of the knowledge to whoever and whenever, that, that's like through the book. And a, I have a, a basically a daily podcast. Like, it's like three to five minutes that I send out. And it's something that the whole idea of the book was like, it's a mentality, it's a lifestyle. And, I, and then I told my guy who published the book, I'm like, dude, how can I just write this book and then disappear? And on the book, we say it's a mentality, it's more than a book, it's a mentality, it's a lifestyle. I said, how can't we continue this? And so since then, I started doing these daily emails, which sort of evolved into this blog and then these kind of short podcasts, which are just constant reminders of just sort of principles to live our life and stories that go with them. So an important question I want to ask, I don't want to lose the opportunity to, to connect you with our fans, you know, the, the people watching this, listening to this. How do they find that? Uh, they go to ericburns.com, E-R-I-C-B-Y-R-N-E-S.com. Uh, and then on there, you could, you could join the, the daily email list. Um, the, e, the Hustle podcast is what it's called. Uh, the Hustle podcast is on iTunes. Uh, very easy to go to, just start clicking through them. And so basically I was writing these things and recently I did this for, you know, almost a year and then stopped for a couple months. And the reason why is just want to stop and kind of gather it and say, how can we best reach the most amount of people? And so we wanted to make sure we did it right. And so we created the podcast. And so I'll basically read these things, right? And then free flow after it. And just free flow off of the idea. And it's funny because I used to say the writing, like all this stuff is like really therapeutic for me. And, it, and it's really good you know, for me to experience it. But now to see the reaction that comes in from other people, I'm like, damn, dude, that's, that's what life's about. It's, it's just passing it on and um doing everything in your power to positively affect the next generation and give them a blueprint of of how to charge forward and you know i, I think we're all all pushing these limits that's why you fit in here so well that's what we're all about right love it thanks brother. Absolutely love it thanks stuff, man. Thank appreciate you. it man i mean thank goodness you know i think my root source energy sometimes i get scared like i'm the only alien left from that tribe on this planet and then i meet him and i'm like Woo! we still do like we still do exist yeah yeah he Love is uh, well he, he does is. more than exist i know he thrives <laughs> that's a great he, point right he is thriving and he, he is, is thriving he is, he, well he, done good he lad. is electricity i know blessing. you know it's all energy and it's all forward movement <sighs> I, I, I thought so of, i thought on that though because here's a guy i mean he's had unusual success you know there are a lot of great ball players out there who do not make it to the pros right, right? Yep. there are a lot of great pro ball players who then just slide into obscurity afterwards this guy he's he looks like he'd be playing ball today he comes in here with the same energy i think that's if, if i think this guy is a secret it's that a he fiddle. approaches everything like this with that intensity oh just dives into everything full tilt and the haircut of a 25 year old it doesn't <laughs> oh, hurt got, it doesn't hurt those nice buzz line waves but he's <laughs> i have the haircut of a 70 year old i mean look he did his first iron man with a beach cruiser right that no, didn't it, work it, out it, for him his first triathlon with a beach yeah. cruiser yeah i just love how he's just got like the go for it mentality he's like oh triathlon i got 
a beach cruiser. It's a bike, right? Bike. All right, just go for it. I mean, what 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 do you um what could we take from him that uh, others could apply and say uh, these attributes so are what make you successful? Uh, uh, it's uh, like uh, what you always say. You always say if you always wait till you think you're ready or everything's perfect, you're never gonna do something. You one. just like jump right in and figure out what you need to fix or work on for the next time for the next one. But F like, don't F make it your excuse. F F I O. Yeah, uh, yes, <laughs> that was the that was part out. of my. <laughs> Hey, like Tim. The uh, formative uh, years here. Think, we'll You're working on what that means? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll <laughs> probably get it at some point. I know. I got it, Sephra. I know. That was in my mind. Right. So it's energy. It's yeah. energy. It's practice like, uh, yeah, like you mean it. Well, and he didn't specifically say this, but and it's kind of a somewhat of a common theme. There, there was no fear, right? He, he no, dude, that's took, no well, fear. I mean, he took on the challenge. Yeah. Uh, he, w he was, you say, what can you learn? He, he got invited to go down and do a uh, triathlon that he'd never done. Talked about not even... He swam because he was a surfer, but he'd never swam competitively. He never in a race. Said he but almost he, But drowned. he had some confidence, but he also had no fear. Okay, I can do this. Some confidence level. Let me go try this, right? And so he just kind of almost ignorance is bliss kind of thing. He just went for it. Yeah, because he says and it's he, the he, start that stops you. It, right? It's the start that stops you. It's the start that stops you. That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, that's a good right line, Ian. We'll, we'll stumble, bumble, rumble till we get it. That's it. Say it again. It's the start that stops you. It's the start that stops you was his phrase, and, and you know and that's the hardest so part true. of running is putting on your shoes and getting out the door, right? Yeah. yeah. How do we how do we apply the batting cage to our lives? So yeah, I love I love when he talked about this. He talked about that as a kid, his parents bought him a, a, a batting machine, a batting cage, or sorry, a pitching machine, right? Pitching uh, machine, actually. And and it had that arm, you know, the whap arm. <laughs> and uh, he said he went in day one, boom, turned it up full tilt, ninety miles an hour. He said, you know, only know one speed. Go. Yeah. And so, so he said from 13, he's in there swinging at 90 mile an hour pitches. When he got into this big game against a future pro ball player who's throwing 94 miles an hour and everyone else is whiffing, he, uh, he four for four. He steps up four hits out of four. And he said, there's scouts there. And that was the breakthrough. So you think you got lucky, hit four for four with the scouts there. You didn't get lucky at all. You, for the last five years, have been facing 90 mile an hour pitches when most people. We put it at 60 so, so they can knock above your over the fence. Punch well, above your weight and, at all and times. It, once again, for the millionth time, you know, take advantage of the opportunity, right? He had the opportunity. He wasn't starting. He was called up. Yeah. And there he was. And there were scouts to see the pitcher at the game. But it was his opportunity. And he took it. And, and he excelled. It's muscle memory. So practice at the hardest possible level you can. And then other things seem easy. If you get up every morning yeah. and yeah. you're jumping in the freezing cold and running up high mounds, when you go down low and it's warm up, it's easier day. Yeah, he I'm also, go ahead. I was going to say he also, you know, we talk to people who succeed, they get to this level, but it's not just about getting to that level. He got to the level, got dropped down, got called up, got dropped down. He's up and down nine times. He said, so, so there's like, lots of peaks and valleys along and, the way. And he said, he, when he finally got his breakthrough, this was huge. He finally got his breakthrough. It was because he wasn't even on the depth chart. Somebody got hurt. There was somebody else who really should have been there ahead of him. They go, we just need some energy. Right. We need some energy, energy. right? Let's, Let's throw Eric in there. Eric right. runs out, um, gets a hit. So he comes back next game. Went on a 22-team game hitting streak. He said, that was how I held them hostage. I just kept <laughs> hitting, right? <laughs> so right. you, you, you got to show up. You got to just show you gotta up. You got to show up. Yeah. You got to practice. A again, you go back, though. You start. You, you, you take it. You start peeling back the onion. Oh, you know? thank oh, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you go back a little bit. And he, his father had told him the two things people can never take from you is education and experience, yep. right? So he, again, there was a core value there. So when he made the tra transition, he played in college for four years at UCLA. Uh, he had pretty good numbers. Uh, nowadays, he would probably leave school after a year or two years or something to play pro. He stuck around in four, for four years, even though he had been drafted multiple years, all right, because he, he believed in the education, and he said he loved the right. That helps the transition when the professional athlete is gone and you look for the next challenge. He had something to fall back on, right? He had, one, a love of writing, and two, some some uh, academic credentials. But yeah. I think, yeah. I mean, that's a creative outlet, right? Because he also said he did go through some pretty dark, hard times. And we find that over and over again in the ultra community, all these places, that people are running long distances because it's running some things out of their system. That's and therapy their, in the world. Right? That's right. Yeah. And yeah, so it's like me meditation. Yeah, that's what I love, that's what I love to say. It's like, don't take your feelings so personally. And a lot of people, especially in this day and age, they're taking everything so personally. You just put it out there. Get out there. Go do what you need to do. Get your feelings out. Be real, right? Suck the bone marrow out of life, folks. Like, <laughs> not with, a dress rehearsal. And with that, send us like, some comments, would you? Yeah, really. What All do right. you guys think about his energy? Send us some comments. Make sure you subscribe. And um, otherwise, Colonel Nye's coming to your house. Yes. At <laughs> night. At night. At night. <laughs> 
This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Gone Rogue High Protein Chips. 17 grams of protein in one crunchy ounce. Visit GoneRogueSnacks.com, enter promo code SPARTAN25 for 25% off. To today's episode of the Spartan Up Podcast. Find us on Instagram at Spartan Up Podcast. Let us know what worked, what didn't, what you tried. And remember, we're here for you almost every day of the week with interviews every Tuesday and with a team of experts to help you stay on track and be your partners in resilience training for mind and body. See you next time.